dir, Professor Thompson, dir, Pachi, Juba, Ramon, dir, Chris, dir, Dr. Rohe, Excellences, colleagues from the Technical Support Unit, Head of the, Techn of the Technical Support Unit, Jan Minx, dir, Authors of the IPCC, ladies and gentlemen, and friends. I have to admit I'm quite glad to be here. I feel very much exhausted over a, a tough week uh, and uh, I haven't felt too much relief. But nevertheless, I'm very happy that we can now present the contribution of our working group to the fifth assessment report. Now, let me start with a, a simple observation. And this is related to the science policy interface. And in our working group, we, over, a, over the last few years, we have used very often a metaphor. And this was the metaphor of a map maker and a navigator. And we perceived ourselves within the working group three as authors, as the map maker. And the map maker tries to produce maps and these maps should be useful for a navigator. A map maker is successful when he explores different pathways and informs the decision makers about the underlying costs, opportunities and risks. And also, the resolution we have to choose is dependent on the purpose of the map. But we have always to recognize that we as scientists, we as map makers are not the navigator. The navigators are the politicians the decision makers, the public. And therefore, in the IPCC, we always highlight that we want to be policy relevant without being policy prescriptive. We have no intention to prescribe a specific pathway. We have no intention to impose specific policy instruments on societies. We see ourselves as facilitators of a rational debate how to deal with the climate change issue. This was our intention, and this is exactly what the phrase should say, being policy relevant without being policy prescriptive. But at the same time, this has a strong implication. In working group two, and Chris has this highlighted in his presentation very eloquently, and in working group three, we have to deal with facts and values at the same time. We have to recognize that the distinction between facts and values has already collapsed. We have to find a reasonable way how to deal with values and facts at the same time. How can we do this? The only way is we have to think in alternatives. And we have to provide the alternatives to the societies. And hopefully this kind of map making might facilitate not only a reasonable debate about the underlying uh, facts, but also a reasonable way how to discuss with values, about values. I deeply believe that there is a rational way to talk about values and value systems. Now, along these lines, you can see that we have basically three components in our report. The first and the most important component are the chapters. And here within the chapters, the scientists have the full control. No government, no politician has the right to impose something on their authors. And then we have the technical summary. The technical summary is a joint exercise between the scientists and it, it, it uh, has the component available, which the scientists want to communicate to the society. And then we have a summary for policymakers. The summary for policymaker is not just the consensus between the scientists. The summary for policymakers is the consensus between the scientists and the governments. And this was the purpose of the last week, to come together with the governments, to discuss with them, sometimes to fight with them about what is the consensus between science and politics. And this is the unique feature of IPCC. It is the only institution, at least I know, 
which is not an international panel on climate change, but an intergovernmental panel on climate change, which has the potential to create a buy-in ownership of the governments. And it has some educational parts. All the governments around the globe read this report. Otherwise, they couldn't attack us. And this is very important to understand. So at least in every country around the globe, there are a few experts who have read this report. I always thought I am the only one who has read the 2,300 pages. No, it's not true. Hundreds of people have read this report, and this makes me very proud. Now, let me continue. Now, what are the basic findings? And I apologize. We have a lot of complicated figures, but as you know, the IPCC has a remarkable reputation to produce complicated figures. But even if you are not interested in these complicated figures, don't worry, the main messages are always uh, uh, spelled out so that everybody has access to the most important insights. And this simple graph conveys a very simple message. Emissions are rising, rising, rising. And they are not only rising, we can see over the last decade we have the highest growth of emissions. Energy, supply and industry are responsible for three quarters of the increase in emissions. And we are on a track with rising emissions. And this is very important to understand that despite of the financial crisis, despite of remarkable efforts around the globe to mitigate climate change and to reduce emissions, we are not on track. Now, the second figure here is also very important. So what you can see here is the cumulative emissions since, 2000, uh, uh, since between uh, 1750 and 2010. And it is absolutely crucial that about half of the cumulative anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions have occurred in the last 40 years. So when I was 12 years old, there was basically not a real climate problem. But now we have accumulated more than half of these emissions over the last four decades. And global CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustions are known with a reasonable range of uncertainty. And we can also see that now the uh, OECD countries have accumulated a lot of emissions, but now new players came in, in particular in Asia. Now it comes to my second point, to describing emissions. Now these are the regional patterns of greenhouse gas emissions. And they are shifting along with the changes in the world economy. But look at this picture. You can see here the low-income, the lower-mid-income, upper-mid-income, and high-income countries. In the low-income countries, emissions come basically from the agricultural sector. But then you can see in the upper-middle-income countries, you see an increasing share of energy, transport, and industry. And it's very interesting, because in the past, what we can see here, there was basically no leapfrogging. The lower middle and upper middle income countries have replicated the development of the high income countries. There was no leapfrogging in the past. There is structural change in the world economy, fundamental structural change, but at the same time this structural change is based on fossil fuels, is based on an increase of energy supply, industry and transport. Now we can have a look on the global emissions from another perspective. And I would like to ask you not to spend too much time to understand uh, the left figures. I would like to draw your attention simply to the right-hand figure. In the right-hand figure, you can see that there is a lot of variation in emissions. In emissions in the low-income countries and in the high-income countries. The variations within the low-income countries is basically due to deforestation. The variation in the high-income countries depends partially on the policy choices. And this is partially good news 
because it allows us to understand that the variation within the high income countries indicate that policy choices are possible and can be effective. Now the last slide on historic emissions. This slide shows a very important fact. And the important fact is that the import and export of emissions is basically reflects the pattern of international trade. What you can see here is that the high income countries are the main importers of emissions. And the middle income countries are the main exporters of emissions. And this means we, we the high income countries, import goods and capital from the upper middle income countries and at the same time we import emissions. And this figure clearly shows and indicates that it is not possible that one group of countries can solve the climate problem. We need a kind of an international cooperation. Now at a global scale, what are the main drivers of emissions? The main drivers of emissions are quite simple. It's economic growth and population. While economic growth is the most important component for emission drivers. And economic growth has outpaced emission reductions from improvements in energy intensity. There was a lot of energy efficiency improvements allowed around the globe, but this has been overcompensated basically and mainly by economic growth. But now it comes to a very worrying effect. And the worrying effect is that over the last decade we have seen an increasing carbon intensity due to the fact that in many parts of the world, including US, China and India, coal becomes incredibly competitive. So what we have seen in the last decade is that the increasing growth of emissions was driven by economic growth, but also by an increasing carbon intensity, which means our world economy is now much more carbon intensive than it was one decade ago. Now, what can we do about this? What are the consequences of this emission trajectories? Now, first of all, and this is the fundamental message, with more mitigation, without more mitigation, global mean surface temperature might increase by 3.7 degree to 4.8 degree over the first century. This is beyond uh, all the thresholds uh, which can be characterized within a safe space, so to say. Chris Field has articulated this very explicitly, that within this uh, uh, space of uh, uh, emission, uh, sorry, uh, within this uh, uh, range of uh, increases of the global mean temperature, we are in an area of dangerous climate change. But now it comes to a very important aspect here. We are talking now about the reasonable long-term goals. People say two-degree target might be appropriate. Other people challenge this and argue we might relax the mitigation goals because they are too ambitious. But here it comes to an important aspect. Even a three-degree scenario shows substantial, requires substantial change. What is done over the next 20 years does not change if one relaxes the temperature target from two degree to three degree. And this is very important to understand. And in addition to that, by the end of the century, and this is clearly articulated here, by the end of the century, we need negative emissions. Now, let me move on to explain a little bit about the underlying requirements of long-term mitigation efforts. Mitigation requires technological and institutional changes, including the enormous upscaling of low and zero carbon energy. And again, I apologize that this is a little bit complicated, but what you can see here is, you have, you, here you have different stabilization goals. A relatively uh, relaxed mitigation goal, and this one here, the last one, the blue one, is consistent with the two-degree target. 
But what you can see here is the enormous amount of upscaling compared to the current level in 2010, but also compared to the baseline, uh, around more than 300% of upscaling in low and zero carbon technologies and energy. These scenarios, and this is really worrying, assume immediate introduction of climate policy as well as the rapid upscaling of the full portfolio of mitigation options. For such a scenario, we need a full portfolio of technologies available in all sectors and which are strongly depend on the availability to remove large amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We need carbon dioxide removal technologies. What does this mean? I will explain in a few minutes. Now, what about the long term and the short term? IPCC has been always accused it has a focus on the long term, and everybody knows in the long run we are all dead. But now let's think a little bit more about the short term and the long term. The short term and the long term. What you can see here is these are all scenarios between now and 2030 which are consistent roughly with the two degree target. So you can choose a pathway where you increase the emissions. And these increasing emissions are basically consistent with the current Cancun pledges. Or you can be a little bit more uh, uh, ambitious and to reduce the emissions. But what we do in the next two decades depends our curse of policy actions after 2030 fundamentally. And this is shown here. This is the historical emissions what we see here. And you can see historically we have never been able to reduce emissions. And let's assume now that we run this pathway where we have no short-term ambitions. Then in the end, in order to achieve a two-degree target, after 2030, we have to reduce the emission by 6% per year. 6% per year. This is a scale of emission reduction which is unprecedented in economic history. If you want to avoid such a risk, what you then have to do is you have to start now or tomorrow. And then even that you have requirements of around 3% of emission reduction. And the same can be translated in the upscaling of the low carbon technologies. Now let's move on. What about the costs? Now the costs are affordable, at least in a way that it shows, the analysis shows that economic growth can be reconciled with emission reduction. It is not required that climate policy sacrifice fundamentally economic growth and therefore the perspectives of economic development in particular for the developing countries. Now we have calculated the costs and it turns out in the short term we have around let's say 3%. What does this 3% mean? It means we have a delay in economic growth but not a reduction in economic growth. And you have to have in mind that the cost estimates exclude the benefits of mitigation. Chris Field has presented, so to say, the impacts of climate change. If we can avoid these impacts, then we have a benefit of our climate action. We have excluded this because we felt that it would be inappropriate to come up with numbers because the uncertainties about the climate damages are quite high. And also, they exclude other benefits, in particular for developing countries and economies in transition, for example, the improvements of air quality. And all these cost estimates are based on a series of very important assumptions, which are quite important for politicians. This means all countries begin to mitigate immediately, they introduce a globally uniform carbon price, and they allow the use of all key technologies. What are the key technologies? renewables, energy efficiency, carbon capture and storage, bioenergy combined with carbon capture and storage, and also in some parts of the world, nuclear power. Now, this is a very interesting question because there are many pathways to achieve these this, this global mitigation goals. We are not saying it's just pan pathway. There are pathways we have analyzed 
where some countries rely mainly on renewables and energy efficiency, it's doable. But other countries might choose a different pathway. And what we have done here is to be explicit about the underlying costs. Now, mitigation can also result in co-benefits. And I mentioned this, climate policy can be an excellent entry point, in particular for countries like China, to start to reduce emissions and at the same time to improve local air quality. You might have seen how severe the problems in China are. And for China, it is quite important to understand there is a strong linkage between climate policy and the improvement of local air policy. And this is one road which I would like to wish the scientific community will draw some attention. How can we bring the short-term co-benefits to the people in order to convince them that the long-term climate policy uh, uh, goals are worthwhile to pursue? Now I come to my last point on mitigation. Mitigation requires changes throughout the economy. It's not just one sector. It's not just the, the energy supply sector. It's not just the power sector. What we found out is that in the future, the agriculture and the forest sector will play an enormous role in mitigation. Why? The reason is quite simply, we need negative emissions in the second half of the century. Afforestation, reduced deforestation, bioenergy in combination with carbon capture and storage and carbon capture and storage could help us to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And this is fundamental in order to achieve a low stabilization goal. Otherwise, we will fail or we have increasing costs. And you can see here with the comparison between a low stabilization goal around 450 ppm with CCS and without CCS. If you have CCS not available, you have to produce negative emissions in the agricultural sector, which means more afforestation and which means more bioenergy, which has its own risk. And by the way, we have analyzed the underlying risk of these pathways uh, thoroughly. We are not arguing here that mitigation is a riskless thing. And we are not arguing here that mitigation is a free lunch. It might be a lunch which is worthwhile to buy, but it's not a free lunch. And it is not without risk, and we have to take care, we have to take care of this risk, because without risk management and reasonable methods of risk management, we are also uh, doing harm to communities and, social soci and, and societies. Now, what about the investments and the investment flows? This kind of transformation pathway requires a fundamental reinvestment strategy. We need more investment in the power sector and we need in particular investments in non-OECD countries. And we need some disinvestment in uh, sectors like the fossil fuel industry without CCS. And we need investment in CCS because otherwise we couldn't achieve the low stabilization goals and we need fundamental uh, scale up of the investments in energy efficiency. Now, what about policies? In our chapters, we said a lot of useful things about policies. For example, that sector-specific policies have been applied, but we need a sector-wide uh, 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 application of policy instrument. And also quite interesting, we did some analysis on carbon taxes emissions trading. And in particular, it was interesting that all countries on planet Earth agreed in this report that the reduction of subsidies for greenhouse gas-related activities in various sectors can achieve emission reduction. This is, from my point of view, a real breakthrough. Another important aspect on policy is the climate problem involves global commons and needs international cooperation. Why? This is a very simple graph. It's not in the R4-5 report. It's in our report on special, our special report on renewables. And in this report, we show what we have underground in terms of gas, oil, and, and coal. And what would happen if we would deplete our oil, gas, and coal resources according to our economic interests without climate policy. It would lead to a situation where the global mean temperature increases by four degrees Celsius. In order to manage this resource depletion, we need international 
cooperation, international cooperation, which can pursue at any level of governance, which requires a new thinking about justice and fairness. And also, this is quite important, and here I would like to remind you, these are the key requirements. All countries cooperate and begin to mitigate immediately or soon. They introduce a global uniform carbon price and they allow the use of all key technologies. Is this, utop is this a kind of a utopia? It's not what we see now, but these are the underlying requirements. And it is worthwhile to communicate to the decision makers and to the policy makers that these requirements has to be fulfilled. Otherwise, we are not on track. We cannot achieve a two degree target. Now, let me conclude. My personal conclusion of this report is it was a very exhaustive exercise. I am tired, but I am happy. It was an enormous challenge to bring together all these experts and authors. It was a real school of interdisciplinarity. It was exciting, and in the end, it was deeply satisfying. Now, I would like to offer you my personal conclusion of this report, and I would not I do not intend to hijack the other orders. My conclusion is, it does not cost the world to save the planet, but it requires a huge effort, the right incentives, and a lot of goodwill. Thank you very much.